Well, we, we can all agree, I'm sure, that this week has been a feast in God's word. And I have to say, I'm kind of sad it's come to an end. I was, Mervyn, I was getting used to my devotion, morning devotions at 8 o'clock every day um, in, in 1 Corinthians. And you've sort of left me with a conundrum because I had, a, I had plans, right, to read my own books that I had chosen. But I feel like now I have to read 1 Corinthians, which is a great thing. And so thank you for opening up God's Word uh, to us uh, this morning and for faithfully preaching it, exposing the Word of God. I think you've set us up for, for the year and, in fact, for the rest of our lives for a gospel-centered uh, life as, as Christians in our community and beyond our community and for ministry as well. And so thank you for faithfully preaching God's word and opening it up to us and explaining to us. And I do look forward uh, to this morning's message. Uh, you would have noticed that we've been praying uh, throughout summer school for different groups in our community. And so I'm going to continue uh, this morning in that light and pray uh, for the staff team of the college who help make the college run. So please join me as I pray. Our Father, we thank you for the faithful preaching of your word um, this week by Mervyn in 1 Corinthians. Thank you for helping him to prepare and to faithfully open up your word and expound it. Uh, what a challenging teaching we have had this week, but also encouraging words, Lord. And I pray that what we have had will not be snatched away by the devil, because he would like to do that. But help us, Lord, to apply it into our lives through your spirit every day so that we can mature in our lives as Christians as we've had and not become like the Corinthians who were prideful and immature and yet they thought they had arrived. Help us not to think we have arrived. Help us to seek the maturity that comes from you. And Lord, to serve others even more and better as a result of hearing and applying your word. Please help Mervyn as he continues to be a faithful servant, to be loving and serving to you and the people at, of St. James, we pray. And Lord, we also want to thank you for the many staff teams that help the college run. I would think of the principal's office team, the registry team, the front office team, the IT team, the finance and business management team, the maintenance team, the explore team, the tail height team, and the faculty team. We thank you for each one of them, for the gifts that you have given them, and that they are using them, Lord, for your kingdom. Lord, energize us for the year with the fuel that comes from you, so that we may serve and continue to serve wholeheartedly. Increase our maturity as well and our love for you, and others as we serve. Help us to be humble servants, to love and serve the college community that you have called us to serve. I will pray also in particular for those of us who will be teaching uh, this year, Lord, to be faithful in preparation and teaching, and to do that not for fame or for celebrity, but as your slaves to serve, to serve you and love you and serve our community. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Mervyn. Well, Habari Asaboy, Missouri San. Never mind. It's just that we uh, have the great joy of having East Africans with us at this college. Over the years, it's been a great pleasure, and I thought it would be time to greet them in Kiswahili. So that's what that was all about. It's lovely to be uh, with you. Um, thank you for, Tapelo, your kind words. Um, you can collect your 
payment at the end. <laughs> um, but it has been a joy to be with you. And um, let me say that I join in my prayers with the prayers that have been prayed for your year, that it may be a really fruitful and encouraging one for you. We're going to read in just a moment. But let me begin just by reminding you of something that came out, actually, in what was said earlier, that at least for this week and in our focus on 1 Corinthians, I have highlighted the fact that from where I see it, I know there are many different views of this letter, and I've read a good number of them, but from where I see it, the root of the problem in Corinth at the time that Paul writes this letter is what I might perhaps call an ongoing immaturity and an ongoing worldliness. I mean, you can understand that the church would have been worldly and immature in the early days after its founding, right? When you come into the Christian faith and when you come into the ch Christian church, you're not instantaneously changed. You don't go from being what you were to something new, at least in your expression of life. You do change dramatically, sanctified in Christ Jesus, is how Paul puts it in chapter 1, verse 2. You are taken from death to life, from darkness to light, and conversion is an extraordinary thing. But it's got to work its way out, and the shadows of our former lives are long. <laughs> our immaturity lasts and our worldliness lasts. But sometime along the way, we have to start changing, right? If 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years later, we are just as we were when we first became Christians, then some very intensive spiritual surgery is needed. And I think that's what's happening. I think Paul's previous letter was written out of concern for the ongoing immaturity and worldliness. When I wrote to you, remember chapter 3, I could not address you as spiritual, but as infants. Or rather as mature, but as infants. As spiritual, but as worldly. So when he writes his previous letter before 1 Corinthians... Paul is writing because he's bothered by the fact that these Corinthians just aren't making progress. At least not so it would seem. And my view is, challenged I know in some literature, but my view remains, that that previous letter provoked them to write back to him in strong terms. They misunderstood him and they did not like what he said. And so 1 Corinthians is Paul's pushback. So we've spoken about this ongoing immaturity and worldliness. What we haven't really talked about is how immaturity and worldliness actually connect with each other. How do those things actually fit together to create this Corinthian problem? And to engage with that question, I think we need to look at 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. So let me read that now. Remember in verse 17, Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Actually, if you do have a chance to look at the Greek text, you'll discover that the word power doesn't occur in verse 17. He simply says, lest the cross of Christ be emptied. But as we read down, we discover that, of course, the thing of which it is emptied is power. In the context, power is the right word to supply there, which I think both the NIV and the ESV do. Is that right? I think the Holman Bible has another translation there. Well, let me read from verse 18. For the, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where then is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, 
It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For, verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, when you look at verses 18 to 25, at first glance, they look like a rich but relatively straightforward piece of discourse. As if Paul was simply delivering a lecture on the power and the wisdom of God. Paul gets an email and they say, Paul, please could you write an article, an essay on the wisdom and the power of God, um, and it'll count, I don't know, 10% of your year mark. Please send an essay immediately. You've got a deadline, no more than 1,000 words. I haven't actually counted the number of words. They're not that many. And, uh, and we need a little paper on the wisdom and the power of God versus the wisdom and the power of men. So that's what it looks like. That's what initially it feels like. And certainly you must agree with me that the central theoretical argument of the essay, verse 25, the main point that Paul is making, it would seem, in his essay, is a very striking and a very compelling one. Right? Let me read it for you again. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men, implied, and the weakness of God is stronger than the, strong, the strength of men. Though the world fails to see it, and though the world refuses to acknowledge it, says Paul, God is really, truly wiser and stronger than we are. Do you agree with that? Of course you do. There'd be something really strange about your Christianity if you did not say yes to Paul. So we'll give him 10 out of 10 for his essay. Well, perhaps nine and a half. There might have been a spelling mistake or something. Perhaps we'll, we'll penalize him 1% for not using punctuation and writing such long and involved sentences. Translating Paul is fun. You wonder if he ever heard of a full stop or a comma. No, no, this is self-evident and pretty obvious, really, to any Christian person that the wisdom of God is wiser than the wisdom of the world and that the strength of God is stronger than the strength of the world. And surely this would be and should be and must indeed be the basic presupposition underlying the ministry philosophy of any Christian church worth its salt. So would one assume, right? So once again, let me remind you that when we read the Bible, the trick is not, well, trick, the tool is not only to look at what it says, but why it says what it says. So this is the question. Why does Paul feel the need to tell the Corinthians this? I mean, it really is such an obvious thing to say, that the wisdom of God is wiser than men and the strength of God is stronger than men. I mean, every self-respecting Christian knows that. Every self-respecting church knows that. So, Paul, why are you telling them this? And from my point of view, I can only conclude Paul is telling them this because the Corinthians are in danger of forgetting it and of drifting away from it. He's reminding them of something that they should know, but which they are in danger of forgetting. And why are they in danger of forgetting it? And this brings me back to this question of worldliness and immaturity. They are in danger of forgetting it because, well, of the particular form that their immaturity takes. You with me? If you're in danger of falling asleep, stand up and listen standing up. I assure you, you'll wake up very quickly if you fall asleep as you hit the floor. I, too, have done language school. I know what it's like. So, let me think with you about immaturity. How does immaturity manifest itself amongst Christians? Well, I have been a Christian for 42 years and a minister for about 38 or 39. I've lost track. 
But at least over those years, and in my own experience, I mean, that is in my own personal experience, it seems to me that immaturity manifests itself in one of two ways. And sometimes both are present at different times in the Christian's journey. You with me? The one way in which immaturity can show itself is in what I call a rigid isolationism, a harsh separation. So we can only listen to music that is Christian or has Christian content. We can only read theological books. Um, our church must have a coffee shop so that people can come and have coffee at our church. Our church must show movies so that people don't end up going to the cinema. Do you know the sort of thing I mean? It's that kind of cultural bubble, that kind of ghetto mentality, that immaturity in Christians sometimes manifests, cutting themselves off. culture-denying views. So that's one kind of immaturity. And I have to say that in my Christian walk, I have been, I'm going to use the word guilty, perhaps that's still you, and you think, well, what's, what's wrong with that? Nevertheless, in my walk as a Christian, that has been true of me at some point. Where I really try to isolate myself in reading, in music, in everything, from what I saw to be the world so that I might not be contaminated by the world. Well, not to be contaminated by the world is a very noble thing, yes? What we, we do want to not be contaminated by the world. But is isolation the best way to deal with that is the question. You might at this point be wondering, what in the heck has this got to do with 1 Corinthians? Well, just stay with me, will you? On the other side, however... Immaturity manifests itself with this desperate desire to fit in and to be loved and accepted. And perhaps that form of immaturity is more real for some of us in this room than the other. And I think I can think of times in my own life when that has been true for me. Now that kind of desire to fit in, to be in what C.S. Lewis calls the inner ring, the in crowd, in the club. That kind of thing we see everywhere, don't we? We see it in the schoolyard, we see it in the office, and we see it in the church. The question is, which form of immaturity do you think the Corinthians was guilty of? Remember I said that their immaturity was linked or is spoken of in the same breath as their worldliness. So as Paul thinks about immaturity in terms of either isolation or this desperate desire to be accepted and to fit in, which one of the two do you think the Corinthians were guilty of? Well, I think the fact that Paul puts the word worldliness alongside of immaturity means that it was in the second way, this desire to fit in, that the Corinthians were beginning to struggle. I'm talking about them then. Of course, we never have battles with this, right? So the Corinthians wanted to be Christian. There's no question about that. They wanted to be Christians. But they also wanted to be Corinthians. They wanted to be Christians. But they also wanted to be recognized and accepted as Corinthians. They were not culture denying, but culture affirming. But the problem is, they love their Corinthian culture just a little bit too much. They didn't know the difference between affirmation and love. Now, before you think that I'm painting Paul into a particular corner here, turning him into an isolationist, let me disavow you of that view. Okay, come with me. That's not the right word, but anyway. Disabuse you of that view. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 to 11, verse 1. Anybody who is an evangelical Anglican, these are Cranmer's verses. 
You may not be an Anglican, in which case God bless you and welcome. <laughs> but if you are an evangelical Anglican, then let me tell you, if I may speak to the inner circle, <laughs> let me tell you that these are Archbishop Cranmer's verses. I am a dyed-in-the-wool prayer book Anglican. I love the articles, I love the prayer book, I love all that Anglicanism stands for, proper Anglicanism. I'm talking about the nut stuff that's going on in England and America at the moment. Well, here it is, 1031. So whether you eat or drink is a famous verse, right? Or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So there's the boundary, there's the fence. Don't do anything that will not glorify God. Verse 32, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everybody in everything. For I'm not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. If you want to sum those verses up, you can call them theological pragmatism. In other words, if it's not compromising to the glory of God, be inventive and do your thing. Now, one of the ways of talking about that, at least in Anglican circles, is to talk about that as the normative principle. If it's not against what the Bible teaches, you're free to do it. There's an article that says the church has the right to ordain ceremonies, provided they are not repugnant to Scripture, which is different from the regulative principle, which says, basically, fundamentally, that you need biblical mandate for everything that you do. That's an oversimplification, but at its heart, that's what it is. So in this matter of practice and reaching Corinth, Paul is normative. He is willing to become many things to many people. He'll adjust himself culturally. He'll fit in for the sake of the gospel. Yeah? On matters of practice, if the Bible's not against it, go for it, is Paul's view. But when it, when it comes to the essence of the gospel the content of the gospel, when it comes to salvation, Paul has a very different view. There, he is regulated. There, he has a very narrow take, which really stands in contrast to the culture around him. Contrast to the Corinthian culture, and if I may say so, which stands in stark contrast to our culture today, wherever you come from. So what is the standard, this measure, which puts Paul at loggerheads with the culture, and which always puts Christians in conflict with the culture in which we find ourselves? What is the standard? Well, Paul calls it quite simply, verse 18, the word of the cross. In chapter 15, he's going to refer to it more broadly as the gospel. This is the thing. This is the standard. This word of the cross, which alone Paul preaches, this is the thing that will put Paul the Corinthians, and you into conflict with your culture. So I'm not advocating isolationism, but I'm also not advocating a kind of contextualization which just fits in. You see, the gospel is the true... Well, let me put it this way. I don't know how keen you are to be radical... But I want to say to you that if you want to be truly radical, you need to be an evangelical. Because what the word of the cross, what the gospel will do for you, is it will liberate you from both left and right wing ideology. What the gospel will do is it will give you true freedom. What the gospel will do is it will take you right back to the root and the source and will give you that wonderful thing, thank you Archbishop Cranmer again, of the right of private judgment, where in the light of the gospel you can look at everything, affirm what is good, reject what is evil, not fit in on the left or the right, and walk a definite, clear path. 
For Paul, the cross of Christ, please listen carefully to this distinction. For Paul, the cross of Christ alone saves. Understand this. For Paul, the cross of Christ saves. Words do not save you. You are not saved by theology. You are not saved by philosophy. You are not saved even by evangelical theology. Believing evangelical theology will not save you. Jesus will save you. There's a historical thing that happened that first Good Friday. There was an actual death in history on the cross, and it was in that death that salvation was brought about. Yeah? It's Jesus on the cross and raised from the dead in history which saves you. The companion to this talk this morning is to read Don Carson's tiny little book called Prophetic from the Center. If you've never read it, go and read it. It's only 30 or 40 pages. The cross saves. But how does the cross come to you and me today? How does the cross come to the Corinthians who weren't there on that Good Friday? How does the cross come to anybody anywhere in the world? And the answer is through the word of the cross, through the gospel. So the cross of Christ alone saves, but the word of the cross alone brings that salvation into the experience of people. Which is why Paul can say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God to save. He doesn't think the word save, but what he understands is that the way that the death of Jesus becomes a reality for you, and you take your share in what Christ has done, is through the gospel. And only through the gospel. How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? Not of whom, but whom they have not heard in Romans. And how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? Now for the world and for the worldly church, this narrow, exclusive truth is unacceptable. For some, it is just plain foolishness, folly. Certainly for the Greeks that were around the Corinthians and the Greeks whom Paul knew, it was a foolishness. That little icon of a donkey on a cross from the first century. How can a man on a cross save anybody? What folly? What stupidity? Who believes that today? For others, just weakness. So to the word of the cross, the world and the worldly church says, we know better and we can do better. Now don't oversimplify this because it has a very subtle face, right? To the word of the cross, to the gospel with the cross at the center. So here I am banging that same drum. To the gospel which has the death and resurrection of Jesus at its center at the heart, not somewhere on the side, but at the very center. To that gospel, the worldly church, shall I say, says, actually, we know better today, and we can do better today. We have a more contemporary, more reasonable, more relevant gospel. Let me tell you the story of a university work in England. Many moons ago now, almost a hundred years ago, there was a debate in the universities 
and Christian colleges movement. The debate was about whether or how important the cross was in the gospel. One group of people asked the other group of people, is the cross of Christ central to the gospel? To which the answer came back, the cross of Christ is essential in the gospel. The question came back, yes, but is it central? The answer came back, it is of the utmost importance. The question came back, yes, but is it central? Now, you might think that's just nonsense about words. But the legacy of that was, between the UCCF and the SCM, a break. Because the SCM, though they affirmed the cross, actually had their central focus on other things. The UCCF, though it saw the importance of other things, had its central focus on the cross. And if you want to know the result of that, well, it's very interesting to follow the path of IVP and SCM and the views that are put forward to this day in the publications that come under those two banners. The one ended up in liberalism and in those days the social gospel. The other, for all its faults, remained evangelical. So let me ask you as I finish, do you think this is an issue for us today? Do you think that the evangelical church today is in danger of knowing better than Paul and better than God around what is the gospel? You think we're in danger? Well, I must leave you to draw your own conclusions. But in my own experience in recent times, I have been deeply saddened and not a little bit disturbed to notice how this problem, this bringing a worldly wisdom and a worldly understanding of how salvation happens, keeps intruding and keeps pushing the cross to the margins. Wisdom has to do with knowing the best way to get something done, right? Power has to do with the ability to get it done. Paul tells us that the cross of Christ is both the wisdom of God and the power of God. In other words, of all the ways that there are to bring salvation to the world, to bring about a better world, to change the world, to usher in a brave new age, a new world, of all the ways, from God's point of view, there was only one way to get it done. Because wisdom is picking the best way to get something done. And from God's point of view, the best way to bring about the radical, total, ultimate, life-affirming, problem-solving, perfecting solution that the world needs is the death of Jesus. And that may seem the most irrelevant thing to your friends and the most stupid thing to your friends, some of whom may even call themselves Christians. I constantly get letters from people who tell me that our insistence on the centrality of the cross in the gospel is nothing more than right-wing evangelical conservatives, and that we're not in touch with the real needs of the country. And I keep having to remind them that because I care deeply about the needs of this country, we will keep the cross at the center of everything that we say and do. Because it is the wisdom of God. God knows better than you, dear friend. 
And he knows better than all the clever people who write books about the gospel and try and redefine it. He really does. But not only is it the best way to get it done, from God's point of view in terms of actual accomplishment, it is the only way to get it done. Here is the thing. And let me remind you of this. If you believe and trust in Christ and his death, in that moment, in that moment, your sins are utterly blotted out. Not just your past sins, but your future sins, the ones you haven't even thought of yet. Okay? There are a whole string of sins still coming for you. You haven't even thought of them yet. Even those are dealt with once and for all in the death of Christ. Do you believe that? The moment you trust in that condemnation, the wrath of God is removed from you. The moment you trust in that, you are set on a path to a world full of righteousness and justice, a new creation. The moment you believe that, you are saved. Don't ever stop believing that, and don't ever stop preaching that as if it's unimportant, less important, or irrelevant. God knows better. Does the gospel have a bigger body to it? Does it have implications and consequences? Absolutely. And they should never be ignored. Never be ignored. Right? The gospel not only saves us, but compels us and impels us to live in our culture in a way that makes a difference. Remember, the gospel doesn't drive us into the ghetto or into the monastery. It pushes us out into the world to make a real difference. But dear friends, the most important thing that you carry in the palm of your hand is the word of the cross. Because that doesn't only save people from their circumstances. It saves them for all eternity. What does it profit anybody to fix the world and lose their soul? Should we work at fixing the world? Don't mishear me. 100%. Evangelicals have always been at the forefront. Well, no, rubbish, mother. The best history of evangelicalism is that evangelicals have been at the forefront of endeavors to deal with poverty, injustice, child abuse, you name it. I'm reading a book at the moment which tracks the history just in the 18th and 19th century of evangelical endeavor in the United Kingdom changing the face of society. One man has gone so far as to say, laying the seeds for a welfare society, whether that's an overstatement or not, I do not know. But certainly Britain's system of care and the changes that happened in the 18th and 19th centuries are as a direct result of people who had the gospel at the center. So to say I've got my gospel and everybody else can, well, I don't care what happens to them, that can't be right but to be so caught up in everything else and to lose the heart of the gospel is to be in big trouble. It is to be Corinthian. And honestly, that's not the place you want to be. Well, pray with me, will you? Heavenly Father, we know that balance is a hard thing for us. We so easily swing from one extreme to the other. I pray that we would never allow our zeal for the gospel and our evangelistic heart to blind us to the desperate need of people around us or to disempower us from doing what lies in our ability in order to help them. Please make the Christian church a force for good. Help us to speak against all that is wrong. 
Help us to work for all that is good. But Lord, please help us to safeguard and to hold on to your gospel. And we know that the best way of safeguarding that is to preach it. I pray for each and every one of these, your dear children, embarking on a time of study and then on a life of ministry. May your priorities be theirs. May they trust your wisdom more than theirs and lean on your power more than theirs. And all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It's been fun. Morning. My final announcement for the week. We will have Darren Wehan and Sta Ndaba from Jubilee Community Church. Sta is also one of our chaplains, so if you're in her fellowship group, then please have lunch with her as well. And Cameron Shibangu from Red Post Church in Mowbray. So meet them, talk to them. And next week, the fun continues. On Thursday, we will have Luke Harper from Common Ground Church in the South Peninsula branch. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mervyn. Um, do encourage you, brothers and sisters, to reflect on what we've had uh, this week and this morning, to read 1 Corinthians. It's an opportunity uh, to go and dig deeper into this wonderful book that has truths that still apply very much to us uh, today. I'm sure we've seen that um, this week as Mervyn was preaching from it. And yeah, please do go and reflect and, and think about what we have had and meditate on it. But please join me as I thank Mervyn. We can yeah, be thankful to the Lord um, for him opening up the word and preaching and for taking his time to do that. So please join me thanking him again. <laughs> and do enjoy the rest of summer school and go in peace. Let me just read uh, these words again. Um, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Enjoy your day. <laughs>